All right, so I've gotten a few requests asking about how to use Clover to boot a PowerEdge server or any other legacy BIOS machine from a PCI Express NVMe drive, so I decided to make a video covering it for you guys. This will also cover emails that I've gotten asking why certain NVMe drives will boot PowerEdge servers, but others won't. I unfortunately haven't been very active on the channel lately uh, due to my day job, filling multiple roles within the nuclear power industry. Um, I've been refueling nuclear reactors, performing certain maintenance items and repair items on them, as well as building a bunch of new computer systems that will be used for reactor inspections, which is really cool. Um, it's been very demanding in many ways, with lots of travel being one, but I love it. Hopefully I'll be able to push out some new content soon to the channel, since I've had a lot of ideas for videos pop up, but I guess we'll see when the time becomes available. Anyway, let's get right to it. Okay, so what is Clover? Clover is essentially a bootloader that starts when your computer boots up and lets you point to multiple drives or boot sources that might not otherwise be available. In the use case with PowerEdge servers, this lets you boot from a PCI Express NVMe drive that otherwise does not show up as an option in your BIOS or UEFI. Now, some people will say, but my PowerEdge server already boots from a PCI Express NVMe without needing to use Clover and all that stuff. Well, this is true. But how does that happen? Well, this comes down to PowerEdge server BIOSes only being able to recognize SATA drives, or SATA protocols. SATA, or Serial ATA, is the old protocol and form factor we've been used to dealing with over the past 20 years now, or since about 2003 or so, for most consumers. Well, SATA is both a physical form factor that you plug the cable into on the motherboard and on the hard drive, and it's also a communication protocol, or handshake method, that allows the drive to actually talk to the SATA controller itself. Later, around 2015, NVMe drives started to become popular. NVMe, on the other hand, is solely a communication protocol, or handshake method. That's why there's technically no NVMe ports. That's what the M.2 port, or M.2 form factor, is for. M.2 ports are the physical interfaces associated with the NVMe drives, and is the most common physical interface for them. M.2 shines in the fact that it can tap directly into the motherboard's PCI Express lanes, which is much, much faster than using the SATA protocol, by an order of magnitude over SATA. That means times 10. M.2 ports can support both SATA and NVMe protocols, but it depends on if the motherboard is designed to handle both protocols or not. There's also a few other form factors that came out like MSATA and Mini PCI Express, but for the sake of this video, we'll just concentrate on SATA and NVMe. Certain generations of PowerEdge servers were designed before the NVMe protocol became popular, so they do not support booting from NVMe-only drives due to their BIOS is not natively supporting the NVMe protocol. This is why an M.2 NVMe drive plugged directly into a PCI Express slot with an adapter will be completely absent from the BIOS as a boot option. The ability to boot directly from an M.2 NVMe drive wasn't written into the BIOSes until the 14th gen servers, and even then, you'd need a special BOSS controller, or Dell BOSS controller. On top of that, not all BOSS cards support the NVMe protocol, but that's a whole different topic to go over. So, what drives will work, and what drives won't? In the end, most PowerEdge servers will specifically need an M.2 NVMe drive that also supports the SATA protocol for the BIOS to be able to see it and use it as a boot device. The drive needs SATA support. That's the key with these things. Many enterprise SSDs also include SATA capability, but are usually expensive. Some typical consumer SSDs were available early in around 2015 when the NVMe and SATA protocols were overlapping, but now new ones are either really expensive or you're limited to finding old used ones that are likely worn out, as well as smaller in size at around 256 to 512 gigabytes in size. Not that big by today's standards. The older Samsung 950 Pro M.2 drives do use the SATA protocol and can directly boot from within the BIOS using an M.2 adapter. You can currently buy new ones directly from Samsung on the Amazon store for about $150, but again, they're only 256 gigabytes. If you have plenty of cash to blow, you can also buy the 512 gigabyte 950 Pro at a whopping $362 for just 512 gigabytes. The speeds on the older 512 gigabyte 950s is also limited to 2500 megabytes per second read and 1500 megabytes per second write, 
with a 256 gigabyte model about 500 megabytes slower in read and write. To put that in comparison, for $20 less than a 512 gigabyte 950 Pro, you could buy a 4 terabyte Samsung 990 Pro that delivers 7400 megabytes per second read and 6,900 megabytes per second write. That's almost a no-brainer. Some Intel 950 PCI Express SSDs also carry SATA protocol capability for direct BIOS booting, as well as Samsung PM9 Alpha 3 enterprise drives. The Intel Optane P480-1X is an option as well, but again, they're all usually small on capacity and or expensive for the size. Something to note is that 11th and 12th gen servers do not support something called bifurcation. Bifurcation is where you can split the lanes on the PCI Express slot and run more than one M.2 drive on a single card in a PCI Express slot. One argument is, why not just boot from one of the front SATA or SAS drive bays with a 2.5 inch SSD? Well, you can, but you'll be limited to 6 gigabits per second or 750 megabytes per second maximum as well as taxing the RAID controller for OS operation and using up a drive bay. Considering you could move the boot drive into an unused PCI Express slot with a PCI Express adapter and reach speeds upwards of 8 gigabytes, gigabytes per second, as well as offloading work from the RAID controller and freeing up a drive bay, it's another no-brainer. So, now that we're done with the backstory, let's get on with Clover. Clover lets you circumvent this whole BIOS lack of NVMe support by booting from a USB drive with Clover on it, and then Clover continues the boot process by pointing to the NVMe drive, something called chain loading. You essentially load Clover onto a small USB drive and insert it into the internal USB port of the server. You then go into the server's BIOS and tell it to permanently boot from that internal USB port. When Clover loads up during boot, a menu then pops up asking which device operating system you want to load. Before getting into the actual process of loading Clover, that's the gist of it. Unfortunately, the internal USB port is only a USB 2.0 port with speeds limited to 60 megabytes per second max. But, since Clover is extremely lightweight and loads instantly while only spending 4 to 5 seconds total in the Clover menu for the boot selection countdown, port speed is never an issue. With Clover only being used during the boot process, you could technically remove the USB drive with Clover on it while the server's running with zero issues since its job is already done booting, but you'll need it to be back in place again for the next reboot, otherwise the BIOS will be looking for a USB drive that doesn't exist. What you'll need to start is a USB drive that's preferably small to take up the least amount of physical space, but really any USB drive will work. You'll just want to make sure that it doesn't have a bulky housing so that it fits into the port straight and square. Even though they're all relatively cheap, paying more for a faster USB 3.0 drive is a little pointless because of the server's USB 2.0 speed limitation. So, just for good measure, find a good USB drive that's at least reliable, and you're good to go. USB capacity can be very small, since the Clover files only take up about 10 megabytes, and the Clover boot partition on the USB only being about 100 megabytes. So nearly any size USB will be sufficient. One USB drive that I used in a Dell PowerEdge T420, just because I had it laying around, is a Sunjiang Super Mini 32 gigabyte 2.0 USB drive. It's super tiny, takes up very little space, but unfortunately it's very slow and has an extremely slow sequential read speed of just 22 megabytes per second and a random speed of just 4 megabytes per second. But even with those less than stellar specs, the time spent in Clover during boot is still just 5 seconds and that's again totally due to just the 5 second countdown timer that's built into Clover by default. I'll show you how to modify this timer later in the video. In a PowerEdge R720, I'm currently using a Team Group 32GB thumb drive that I've reviewed on this channel. Despite going against what I recommend as far as size goes, it plugs into the USB port fine, doesn't bind, or... Yeah, it doesn't put the port into a weird angle or anything like that, so it works fine. Plus, the other cool part is, the speed is much greater than the Sunjiang Super Mini with 121 megabytes per second sequential read and 8-ish megabytes random read. Going back to how lightweight Clover is, there's zero difference in the time spent in Clover during the boot process between the two USB drives. Thankfully, write speed doesn't matter at all since the Clover USB is just briefly read and then immediately redirects to continue the boot process. 
you'll want to start by going ahead and installing your NVMe drive and adapter into a PCI Express slot. Which slot you choose doesn't really matter. With my PCI Express adapter cards, I actually remove the PCI Express covers from the cards and install them raw dog into the slots and use vented PCI Express covers to help with airflow around the drives and through the server. I'd usually be against not having a PCI Express card properly supported in its slot, but the adapter cards and drives are very lightweight and the servers rarely get moved. That and the cards don't sag at all and the airflow helps, so I'm good with it. Next, you'll want to boot up the server with your OS ISO of choice from a USB and install it onto the NVMe drive like you normally would to any hard drive. Most operating system installs will be able to see the NVMe drive just fine, so the install should happen with no issues. I've had success with numerous flavors of Linux, PFSense, Windows, even VMware being able to see the NVMe drive on their own, so you should be good to go. Keep in mind once the install completes and the server reboots, you won't yet be able to point to the NVMe drive to enter the OS until Clover is set up onto the USB drive. If you're needing a utility to create a bootable ISO for your OS of choice, I highly recommend using Rufus. You can just search Google for Rufus, R-U-F-U-S, and it's the top thing that pops up. It has lots of nice features, especially for Windows, such as removing the need for Secure Boot, TPM 2.0, and the need to set up a Microsoft account at all, as well as immediately creating a local admin account from the get-go. Rufus is awesome. I'll also post a link to it in the description. Next, we'll take your USB drive and plug it into an extra computer or laptop and install the latest Clover bootloader ISO onto the USB drive. Next, search the web for a program called Boot Disk Utility. It's usually the first link at the very top of the website searches with the name CVAD Mac. C-V-A-D-M-A-C. It was tailored to create bootable USB drives for Mac OS's but works perfect for what we need since it includes Clover on it. The current version is 2.1.2022 Rev 030 Bravo. I'll post a link to it in the description as well. Download the boot disk utility and run it. When the window opens, select your USB drive and click Format. This will make the USB drive bootable. Once it completes, just close the program and that's it. Next, we'll add the NVMe support to Clover so that you can finally boot the OS you've installed on the server's NVMe drive. Open the USB drive using File Explorer and navigate to the following directory. EFI, Clover, Drivers, OFF. Copy the file nvmexpress.efi and place copies of it in the following directories. EFI, Clover, Drivers, BIOS, as well as EFI, Clover, Drivers, UEFI. You'll want to place one copy of that file in each one of those directories. Now, eject the USB drive and insert it into the server's internal USB port. You're almost done. Now, reboot the server and go into the BIOS's UEFI boot settings to make sure the server will try to boot from the USB drive first. At reboot, keep pressing F2 and it'll eventually get into the BIOS. Once in, then navigate to System BIOS and Boot Settings. Make sure the boot mode is set to UEFI, then select UEFI Boot Settings. Within there, make sure the Clover USB drive is set as the top boot option. It will be the one that says Disconnected to Internal USB 1. If it's not at the top, just select UEFI boot sequence, then select the USB 1 drive, then click the plus arrow until it's at the top. Now, back out of the BIOS by pressing escape a few times, and be sure to save the changes you made. Select OK, then click finish, and the server will reboot. When Clover runs for the first time, you'll see the main screen with a few drives to boot from. Most of the time, the NVMe drive you want to boot from is the first one and is already highlighted. Clover will have a 5 second countdown and then automatically boot the first drive that it has highlighted. Now here's an option that you can do. Reduce the Clover menu time. If you don't want to wait 5 seconds for the countdown, you can do the following. You can either remove the Clover USB drive and put it into another computer, or access it from the server it's already in if your OS can read the files on it. In File Manager, the Clover USB will be called BDU by default. Open the USB drive and navigate to the directory BDU. EFI, Clover. Within the Clover directory, find the file named config.plist and search for the line that says integer 5 integer. That's how many seconds Clover will pause during loading and is set to 5 seconds by default. You can set it as low as 0 and you'll never even see Clover pop up, making the boot process immediate, which is fine, but will make getting into the menu impossible later if you want to change anything within Clover. You'll just have to go back to the config.plist file and edit the integer value from 0 back to 345 
if you want to see the Clover menu again. Another option is, if you're running a Windows OS and you don't want the Clover USB drive to be shown in File Manager, you can do the following. In the search bar, search for Disk Management and select it. And when it opens, select the BDU drive at the top and right-click it. Select Change Drive Letter and Paths. Make sure the drive is highlighted and select Remove. It will give you a prompt that says, Some programs may be affected by removing the drive letter, but since no Windows programs rely on the Clover drive, this won't affect anything. Just select Yes, and the Clover USB will now be removed from showing in File Manager. This isn't anything major. It just prevents you from accidentally doing anything with the Clover USB while you're within Windows, since the sole purpose of the drive is just for Clover. Well, that's it. Hopefully you found this useful and are now able to successfully boot your server from a PCI Express NVMe drive and utilize those blazing fast SSD speeds for the OS. If you have any questions or comments about the video, please feel free to leave a comment below. And likewise, if you found this helpful, please give the video a like and maybe even subscribe to the channel. Like I said earlier, I've been very busy with work, but with all things computer hardware being a big passion of mine and also enjoying helping others, I'll try to get some more useful videos cranked out for you guys. Auf Wiedersehen.